So we'll continue from where we left off before. All right. Uh, Robert, what do you think of this case? Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of soft tissue scarring where the ATFL should be. Okay. And if we go to the sagittal images, what do you see here? Uh, yeah, it looks like more soft tissue scarring, maybe some calcification or some. Uh, yeah. You gotta even be concerned whether the patient had prior surgery in this, yeah. system, which I think they did. So this is uh, this is scarring here, and we're gonna. This is gonna be what we're gonna call anterior lateral impingement once we uh, talk about impingement syndromes. Okay. Oleg, what do you think of this case? 1129, 2809. <coughs> so, uh, so it's a, it's a uh, like, prior uh, ligament as injury, right? Healed. Well, what we see is thickening of the anterior Thick tail fibula thickening ligament the fibula. with indistinctness uh, of the margin here, a little bit of inhomogeneous signal intensity within it, Okay. which we see there. This is, a, this is on 11-2809. This is three years after the patient had a fall and the patient had persistent right ankle pain. Mm -hmm. So this is on 11-2809. This is now on 12-22-2010. So what do you see? Uh, that's, that's next, uh, 10th, uh, okay. So, uh, there is a more scarring, right? What? Scarring. Okay. So we see scarring. We can see this kind of scarring here. Why do you think there's scarring? Why there is a scarring? Um, it's, a, it's like, uh, okay. So this patient had surgery. So this is an anterior talofibular ligament repair uh, in this case. Now, this was a kind of a primary repair. Uh, these, these are usually, if they are repaired, they're repaired by grafts. The surgery for this now is uh, pretty uncommon because the anterior talofibular ligament tears tend to heal very well. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I had this procedure on both my ankles when I was in high school. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but but this is what a primary repair looks like. As I think we'll see later, most of the times now, if this requires surgery, this, this are, these are repaired by graft. They put grafts in. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is from Spain. Okay, so history of... Uh, surgery for lateral ankle instability. Okay, Brostrom procedure. Okay. And so here we can see that there's a suture anchor placement here, suture anchor placement there. And then uh, this is where the graft would go, or uh, where the graft is. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think is going on here? Well, in the left image, looks like there's increased signal just cutting through it, so yeah, it gets torn and then the you left. Hear the more the T1s. See a lot of kind of scarring down in this particular area, but I agree with you. I don't really see a really good graph there. Here, if we go on the coronal images, you can try to follow it from one tunnel to the next tunnel across here, and you can see a lot of uh, irregularity in the, in the area. So this is this is the where you, you put in the graft in this particular crave case. This is a, a kind of an internal brace along with uh, uh, the graft here, the internal brace to try to protect it, to allow it to heal. Uh, and this is a, one of the surgical techniques that are used uh, in this situation. Okay. All right, 21 year old injury working out. Uh, so I see a trabecular injury at the medial malleolus and then uh, edema and soft tissue thickening over the lateral malleolus. Okay, see the two markers there 72412. 
Here are the axial images. So it looks like we have a tear in the fibular attachment of the A2 valve. Yeah, it looks like there's a tear here from the from the fibular. Um, and here are the kind of sagittal image. Okay, so this is now 221-2013. Okay. Um, in the delta, the deep delta ligament looks very amorphous. Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, I agree with you. Amorphous in here. We don't see the normal striate appearance. A lot of the edema has gone away. Yeah, we do see some thickening here of the periosteum, of the uh, uh, medium allelis. The axial images, very thinned uh, ATFL. Yeah, and then a lot of thickening of the periosteum here. And uh, often when these heal, they are thickened, but sometimes they can be abnormally thin, which uh, probably provides less stability. Then what are you trying to see here? Okay. Um, so, uh, so the patient was still symptomatic. This is 221, 2013. So now the patient came back on 9-27-2013. Same patient. Okay. Uh, not seeing a lot of the lateral malleolus, and there's a lot of edema within the uh, talus as well. Okay. Here we go back a little bit more, and we can see some of the... Uh, uh, Lateral malleolus, still some of the edema in the, in the, in the talus. Here are the axial images. So what's happened here? Uh, it's a re-injury? With the pain? No, no, if we go back here. Uh, so here we can see the suture anchors, right? And here, well, well this is the wrong. Okay, so here we go. So here's the, the first study on 7-24-2012. Yeah. Uh, and here we can see a thickened but probably approximately uh, avulsed uh, ATFL. And then here we can see some healing, but the patient was still symptomatic. Okay, so this is on 2-21-2013. Uh, looks like the the ATFL might have healed, but it's very atrophic where it healed. Oh, okay. okay. This is two, uh, 13, 2000. And then now if we go to a current study, the patient uh, it looks like this. And what do you think this is? Oh, is that, a, is that a surgical tunnel? Right. Okay. And then here's a surgical tunnel up in the... Uh, and the lateral malleolus, they can see a lot of bone edema. Yeah, I mean, there's that surgical track. Yeah, you can see a little too. bit of the, the, the surgical tunnel. This is probably the tip of the, of the, of the suture anchor there. <clears throat> and this is 927 again. There's a T2 weighted images where you can see the, the suture anchors around the graft placement. We don't really see a good graft here. Yeah. We see a lot of edema. Uh, here are the sagittal images uh, showing where that graft was placed in the talus with a lot of edema. And then uh, oh, okay. uh, this patient after the repair developed osteomyelitis. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Robert. Okay. Uh, looking at the ATFL, that looks okay. Uh, posteriorly, the PTFL looks like, uh, is that a chronic avulsion fracture there? Yep, probably. <coughs> uh, nothing acute back here. Mm -hmm. It may be some tendinosis of that posterior tibialis and then maybe some partial thickness tearing. Right. Okay. So uh, we're not we're not <clears throat> talking right now about the medial side. With PTT, there was a big problem. Uh, here we can see that there's a 
that chronic posterior revulsion. <clears throat> these are these are pretty uncommon. Most of the injuries we'll see are anteriorly here because these are supination type injuries with external rotation, the SER injuries, which is a, by far the most common injuries of the ankle. Often we just call them inversion injuries. Uh, and with the external rotation, you tear anteriorly, not posteriorly. So this would uh, <clears throat> this would be more of a, a, a internal rotation at the time, which is a, a much less common injury. Uh, but in this case, this is chronic. Okay. Um, let's see who's next. Oh, Oleg. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what's the um okay. we see Is a skin marker here. Yeah, oh, I see a skin marker over there. Okay. So uh it's uh, it's a so you don't really see the anterior talofibular ligament. It's it's it a lateral side. Okay, right that's right. Okay. What about posteriorly here? It's a uh, as well don't see. What? Uh, like uh, looks like two. It's a tear. Okay, so it looks like the posterior, the anterior is torn. The posterior is probably a vulst off its attachment mm -hmm. uh, to the posterior. Talus, right? Oh, okay. And then if we look on the sagittal images, we can see really a displaced ostrigonum, uh, which may have been an old fracture of the steata process. Mm -hmm. And so there are a bunch of injuries in this particular patient. But these posterior talofibrillar ligament injuries are pretty uncommon in my experience. Now, the fibulocalcaneal ligament is uh, very commonly torn along with the anterior talofibular ligament. Now, if you remember the anatomy, the fibulocalcaneal ligament goes from the fibula uh, and goes posteriorly and attaches to the lateral aspect of the calcaneus. And if you have the SCR mechanism or the supination or uh, inversion type mechanism of injury, you distract the lateral side, tearing the anterior talofibular and fibulocalcaneal ligaments. Uh, they, they're pretty close to the perineal uh, tendons. Uh, here are the perineal tendons coming down. Here's the ligament. Here are the tendons. They are in different planes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so here's uh, right at the, its attachment to the fibula, a little bit more posteriorly, and we're just it's just going by the perineal tendons. More posteriorly, we can see that it's it's uh, coming down here, and then as we continue going posteriorly, we can see that the uh, fibulocalcaneal ligament is going to attach to the calcaneus. So it comes down and posterior and attaches to the posterior lateral margin of the calcaneus, and it goes deep to the perineal tendons. If you look in the axial plane, you get the right plane, it could look like this. This one's a little bit thickened, uh, but you can see it's intact. There are the perineal tendons. Uh, right next to it. Okay, here is uh, on a T1 weighted image. Sometimes these can be a little bit inhomogeneous in signal intensity. This one was uh, intact. This is a torn one. It's best to visualize these in the uh, PD fat set or T2 images uh, to detect injuries. Okay, so here, looking in the region, the fibulocalcaneal ligament, I don't really see one. Yeah, so typically we'll have a uh, uh, T2 images in the axial plane the way we normally do it. Uh, they give a little better signal. This is actually an uh, edema within the fibulocalcaneal ligament as seen on a proton density fast suppressed image. I think you get a little bit contrast, better contrast for the ligament and adjacent fat with uh, the T2 non-fat suppressed images. That's why we do. That's one of the reasons why we our primary sequence in the axial plane does not include fat suppression anymore. 
Here we can see the perineal tendons over here. Uh, if we go a little bit higher up, this is where that thickened uh, edematous fibulocochineal ligament is coming off the uh, uh, j just uh, inferior and posterior to the fibula. We're not quite up to the fibula yet. And if we go to the uh, axial T1 weighted image in this particular case, we can see abnormal signal intensity and indistinctness of this torn fibulocalcaneal ligament. And if you follow it back, you can see the ligaments thickened, goes deep to the perineal tendons, and you can follow it all the way back to its uh, where it originates from the inferior fibula here and its abnormal signal intensity all the way. So this is a, 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 a diffuse tear of the fibulocalcaneal ligament. Clinically, these heal very well on their own, so they, these are rarely uh, operated on, and uh, these t typically uh, scar in and heal quite nicely uh, without surgical intervention. Okay. All right. So, lateral uh, to the calcaneus is where I I think I would expect to see the calcaneal insertion of the fibular collateral ligament. You see some, yeah, indistinctness. Okay. This is on 3706. And look, here's what it looks like six months later. All right, so it looks like it's scarred down pretty well. <coughs> and, and again, that typical thickened appearance of a ligament uh, after it's healed that uh, we've seen and talked about repeatedly. So that's a heel fibulocalcaneal ligament. Okay, Robert. All right. Uh, so here it looks like we're a little higher up, and I don't see, you know, I think there's a tear of the anterior tibia fibula ligament and probably a sprain of the posterior. Good, right. Uh, <clears throat> And you need to have cuts going up and down, but this is a cut which should go through the anterior inferior uh, tibiofibular ligament. Here, the posterior one is thickened with increased signal intensity, maybe a little bit of edema within the bone. Go to the sagittal images, we can see the bone edema back here due to the uh, traction injury of the posterior tibiofibular ligament uh, where it attaches to the tibia. And uh, so these are... High ankle sprains are uh, really uh, tibiofibular ligaments. The anterior talofibular ligament in this particular case is still intact, but there may be a little scarring around it. Now, in some uh, in some articles that you'll see, or that used to be in the old days, uh, it was often thought that the, the standard progression of injury was first you tell the anterior talofibular and fibulocochineal ligament. If the injury was more severe, you would go up and tear the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligaments. Mm -hmm. uh, the vast majority of torn, acutely torn anterior uh, inferior uh, tibiofibular ligaments that, that I've seen over the years, the anterior talofibular ligament is intact. So uh, I don't think that's a very common progression of disease at all. I think there are two separate mechanisms of injuries between a high ankle sprain and a standard ankle sprain. Uh, the important difference between these is from, in, in sports injuries, high ankle sprains are typically uh, caused by uh, more severe trauma and uh, typically take much longer to heal before the patient can go back into play. Typically, with a standard anterior talofibular fibulocochineal ligament injury, if it's not complicated, you don't have bone injuries to the Taylor dome or, or other associated injuries, you know, often players can go back to play in two to three weeks. With a high ankle sprain like this, it typically takes more like six to eight weeks. Now, these, these are often, the high ankle sprains are often associated with tears of the syndesmonic ligaments. I think we'll talk about those in a little bit. Let me just... The syndesmonic ligaments are the ligaments that go but, uh, more proximally here between the distal fibula and the, the tibia, uh, and right here in the area where the two bones come close together. Uh, there have been a lot of papers looking at this. 
They're often difficult to directly visualize. Uh, clinically, as we'll talk about in a minute, the most reliable sign uh, to determine whether or not you've got tears in the syndesmotic ligaments uh, has to do with if there's, a, if there's fluid here. You normally should not have fluid but between the two bones here. If you see a lot of fluid here, that highly, is highly correlated with a syndesmotic tear. And if it's severe, sometimes they can extend proximally up into the muscle. Okay, uh, Oleg, you're next. Okay, <laughs> let's take this case. I uh, just uh, showed the uh, uh, injury to syndesmotic uh, ligament. No, no, this uh, this isn't a syndesmotic tear. I was just showing the area there. Ah, uh, the area. Ah, okay. So that's another. Okay. Um. I'm thinking. Uh, Okay. Maybe so, so what's, what's happening here? Over and there. Here. And what's going on here? It's uh, 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 wait a second. So this is what? No, I'm thinking where I am. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Th this is the no, no, lateral malleolus. This is the lateral malleolus. Yeah, lateral malleolus. And, uh, and attachment. Uh, Okay, so here's the base of the fifth. Oh, that's the base of the fifth. Okay. All right. So this is the lateral malleolus. And this is the base of the fifth. So it's this is uh, the perineus longest. Tendon. Yeah, so so it's perineus brevis probably attaches to the base of the fifth. The perineus brevis attaches to the base of the fifth. What's happening up here? Uh the perineus longus kind of goes uh, on the other side. Here's the perineus longus. And it's going even behind, like okay. underneath. Is this normal anatomy? Um, oh. <laughs> that's stupid. <laughs> okay. here, here is a perineus brevis, the okay. base of the fifth. Okay. It's coming up here. Okay. It's going into the lateral malleolus through a hole in the lateral ah, malleolus. Ah, I see. And extending up in oh, here. Oh, it does not, yeah. Where, where it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, attaching inside the lateral, lateral malleolus. Sure. So uh, this is a procedure, <laughs> an old surgical procedure. It's non-anatomic, typically not used much anymore, but it's uh, another one of Jones's procedures. Uh, this was to stabilize uh, instability of the lateral malleolus when he had chronic anterior talofibular ligament tears. Uh, but again, th this is an old procedure. I'm just showing it here so that when you see this, uh, you, you, you'll remember this technique because in older patients, you still may see the, the Jones procedure. Now, people do more anatomic reconstructions using uh, suture anchors and grafts like we showed earlier. Okay, <clears throat> eighteen-year-old male, dorsiflexion weakness after severe inversion injury. Um, so he had an inversion injury to the ankle or an SCR injury to the ankle, and now he's got uh, almost a foot drop, but a lot of weakness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have edema in the lateral muscles okay. of the leg, lower leg. Okay, so, so these are the extensor muscles of the of the ankle, right? Mm-hmm. Anteriorly here. Or anterior. Innervated anterior. by what nerve? Okay. That's a common parallel nerve. One not common but but well described complication uh, uh, sprains of the ankle is that you can uh, tweak the perineal nerve and get a perineal nerve palsies. And this probably occurs due to uh, traction of the nerve around where it goes around the, the head, the, the proximal head of the, uh, of the uh, fibula. Right, right here where it goes very subcutaneous and either from direct trauma or from stretching, you mm -hmm. can get a perineal nerve injury. And here you can see the denervation changes within the, the extensor muscles. Okay. So uh, now let's talk about the medial ligaments. Uh, there's the deep tibio-talar ligament. 
and the superficial tibial navicular, tibial cochineal, and the spring ligaments. So here, we, uh, let, let me just, just go on here. So uh, the deep ligaments, so we have, uh, the, here we can see the deep. Uh, this goes between the uh, uh, tibia and the talus, we can see here. And it has a typical striated appearance. Uh, this is called the deep deltoid ligament. Uh, this is kind of normal appearance. If you lose these striations, that's typical indicates that you've had a prior injury and it healed with scarring. Not that that's all that significant, but uh, but that's typically what it needs. Uh, uh, in the in the coronal plane, sometimes we can see. Uh, the the more the other the other ligaments here, which uh, if we look in a diagram here, we've got the tibiotalar ligament posteriorly, the tibiocalcaneal ligament, and the tibionavicular ligament. So these are the three more superficial ligaments, and then uh, anterior posteriorly down here we have the calcaneal spring ligament, uh, which goes be between the navicular bone and the calcaneus. So there is, these are the ligaments on the medial side. And we can see that uh, 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 they go deep to the posterior tibialis tendon that's here. Here's the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus. And then this is the retinaculum going over it. This is the deep deltoid in here. And these are the, these three out here are the superficial uh, del deltoid. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, yeah the tibial uh, navicular ligament uh, sometimes can be be seen uh, <clears throat> in the coronal plane comes down goes around the the head of the of the talus and then attaches to the navicular bone. So these are often seen on the axial images. We can see the <clears throat> the uh, uh, the superior aspect of the spring ligament. We're going to talk about the three different components of the spring ligament in a minute. That's deep right in through here. The tibiocalcaneal ligament, uh, part of the superficial deltoid complex, is in through here. Flexor digitorum longus is there. Tibialis posterior there. And so these are the ligaments that are deep to the tendons, uh, which, are, uh, which are more superficial. And of course, the tibialis posterior attaches to number of bones, but its primary attachment is to the uh, medial margin of the navicular bone in this location. And here we can see just a, a small type 1 uh, accessory navicular bone within, within the distal PTT attachment. Mm -hmm. And this is flexor digitorum longus, flexor gahalicus longus. This is more inferior. This is a more superior image. Uh, so, uh, Robert, what do you think of this 62-year-old male? Uh, let's see. So here it looks like there's a tear with the deep deltoid. Yeah, right there. And diffuse increase signal density. We've lost that strided appearance mm -hmm. to the deep deltoid. And so that's a tibial Taylor ligament avulsion or a deep deltoid ligament avulsion. Good. Oleg? Um, there is a, a... I don't even see anything there on the, on the medial side. Okay, so here's the medial side. Uh, sorry, the lateral, uh, side. lateral side. Yeah. Here's the talus, there's the tailor dom, mm -hmm. there's the medial malleolus, we're too anterior to see the lateral. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking about the medial ligaments. What yes. do you think about the medial ligaments? So, looks like a tear of the uh, okay. So uh, tear of what? Of the uh, uh, tibial calcaneal and tibial talar. It's a tibial talar. Talar. Tibial talar. We usually call it the deep deltoid. Deep the deltoid. Tibial talar. And you're right. This is torn here, frayed. These these striated lines should be going over here to the talus, and they're inferiorly positioned. So that's a tear. Here it is in the axial plane on a T1 weighted image where we can see the area where you should have a, mm -hmm. a nice uh, deep deltoid and we can see just a lot of amorphous signal there. 
So that's a tibial tailor or deep deltoid so tear. The... So the uh, deltoid tears tend to occur with these inversion injuries or supination external rotation injuries uh, because in, in that mechanism you the, the the forces open up that space therefore put traction on the the deep deltoid and can tear the the deltoids if you had plain films from this study from the hospital special surgery on plain films if the clear space is uh, less than five millimeters on uh, x-rays uh, then uh, it's pretty good, but not great. Uh, the, the accuracy is 46%, but you'll end up having 80% of false positives. The medial clear space is greater than 5 millimeters on x-rays. Uh, the accuracy is much better, 95%. But if you have this large of a separation, uh, your sensitivity is going to be pretty low. Uh, if, if it's less than five millimeters, that clear space on x-rays, uh, then <clears throat> x-rays are, are not very useful. Uh, if you do go to MR, the accuracy compared to surgery is about 79%. The bottom line is, uh, uh, in typical clinical practice, if they're concerned about injuries to these ligaments, uh, most people are going to get an MR scan to evaluate them. Uh, in this particular case, they said that if you're, if the clear space was greater than five millimeters, just go ahead and operate because you're likely to have a tear. If it's less, get MRI. But I think the clinical practice now is before you operate, you want to look at all the injuries around the ankle, not just the deep deltoid. Uh, so I don't know of any of the surgeons around here that we commonly work with who'd want to operate without an MR first. Okay, and this, this just shows the, the tibial calcaneal ligament, which comes down through here, the more, a more superficial uh, ligament on that medial side, which we can see through there. Uh, <clears throat> what do you think of this case? Okay, so looking at that uh, tibio calcaneal ligament, it looks like it's torn more proximally. Yeah, I don't really see it very much. Okay. Right. So in this particular case, both the deep deltoid, mm -hmm. the tibio tailor ligament, uh, we don't visualize, and also the tibio calcaneal ligament, we don't visualize either. So in this case, I think uh, both are torn. And you have some stripping of the periosteum here overlying the medial malleolus as, as well, uh, which can uh, be associated with symptoms. And here we can see the tear with the, the distal ligament being no longer taunt and some uh, uh, stripping of the periosteum of the medial malleolus. There's also some injuries on the lateral side in this patient who had a dislocation. And impaction injuries. All right. And her medial ankle pain. Uh, the deep delta ligaments look amorphous to me. And, and let, let me just say, the one on the left is a symptomatic patient. The one on the right is an asymptomatic ankle. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, the one on the left, the deep delta ligaments are definitely amorphous. The one on the right... You know, still striated. Yeah, this is a, the uh, tibial navicular ligament. This is the anterior, uh, the most anterior ligament of the superficial deltoid complex. Uh, this is now the T2 weighted image of the symptomatic individual where we can see the fraying and tearing of that distal uh, tibial navicular ligament. And if you try to follow it down, uh, it's all frayed here. Uh, whereas I think this is his other side. It goes all the way down here where the tibia, all the way down to its attachment on the navicular, which stabilizes then the, the medial aspect here at the tibonavicular joint. Okay. 
my experience with these, this is the most difficult of the ligaments to evaluate by MR. And I haven't seen any good studies showing its accuracy, but uh, uh, this is one of the few cases that I know that was surgically, uh, that we called that was surgically proven. Okay, Robert. All right, so we have a patient with persistent medial ankle pain after a sprain. And it looks like there's a sprain of the deep deltoid. Okay, down here. Right. And then uh, it's adjacent to the medial malleolus. It looks one of the superficial ligaments. Looks like, yeah. Yeah. Sprain. Yeah. So here's that kind of periosteal stripping that we talked about before. And uh, uh, this, this actually, there's a name for this ligament here that goes to the periosteum. It's called the laciniate ligament. I, I almost always forget that, uh, the name. So I just talk about a little bit of uh, uh, stripping of the uh, periosteum uh, when I see this uh, on images. Unless I go back and look at my lectures to see what Philip had sent me. So this is a 12-year-old with a medial ankle mass. Okay, so here's the marker. Mm -hmm. And deep to the marker, what do you see here? Edema. Okay, so we see edema in the subcutaneous tissues, and we see a little bit of separation of some of the longitudinal structures here. And this is a, another person <laughs> who... Uh, uh, tore this uh, laciniate ligament mm -hmm. and stripped off there. Okay, 48-year-old male, foot pain for two months after an MVA. Um, yeah, looking at the dorsal aspect, the talonavicular joint, there's this thickening of the what I'd call capsular thickening. Okay, the dorsal capsule, mm -hmm. right? On the coronal images, we can see that same thing. Often these little dark things that you see in these can be calcification. So a lot of, a lot of the times these are chronic injuries and you have a, an acute injury on top of chronic disease. And uh, in this particular case, oh, and here we can actually see those calcifications on the, on the plane radiograph. So, uh, in this particular case, I think this is probably an acute on top of chronic. Uh, these calcification could either e either be avulsions uh, of the bone there, which it looks like are part of the case in this case. Uh, most of the time, I think they're chronic calcifications of chronic, chronic ligament disease. Uh, and then you get an acute injury, uh, further injuring what has previously been injured. Okay. All right, so looks like we have a complete tear of the deep and superficial deltoid and well, the dislocation. Deep, I don't know about the superficial. We'd have to see the next cuts. But certainly the, the deep deltoid is torn here. Yeah. And, and then marked instability and displacement. Yeah. And the other ligaments? Oh, the, the tibio... Uh, anterior inferior um, tibio fibular. fibular is torn. So this is like a fractured and dislocation. The posterior is probably torn as well here. So this is a pretty big injury. And then the lateral ligaments. And you're right. There's a fracture here of the, of the fibula. Mm -hmm. Okay, another ligament is called the bifurcate ligament, and that goes between the calcaneus, the navicular, and the cuboid. Uh, it has a you know, medial limb and a lateral limb, uh, <clears throat> and this, this can also be injured. And here you can see the location uh, more in the axial plane. And here's just an example from Dr. Su from Korea. Uh, we can see the Y-shaped 
uh, uh, ligament here, uh, stabilizing the uh, calcaneal cuboid navicular articulation here. Yeah, they say you can see these by ultrasound, <laughs> right? Right through here, uh, and I think for for people like in, in Australia and for a lot of people outside of kind of the U.S. and, and Western Europe, uh, ultrasound can be used a lot because it's available. Uh, it, usually, it requires a physician to do it. And who knows the anatomy and the pathology uh, well. And it's, it's very hard in our environment where most of our radiologists are not physically present where the image is, is being done. I think it's hard to, to work with a, an ultrasound tech and feel comfortable uh, that you're, you know what you're seeing. So we did not use it much. We've tried a number of times, three times actually, uh, to... Uh, to expand our, our musculoskeletal ultrasound. And we ended up basically selling our ultrasound machines to the physiatrist or the uh, sports medicine non-surgical physician who used it to, to then do injections and so forth. Uh, what we found from our referring physicians who are involved in these studies, that even though we could pick up a, an injury on ultrasound, uh, they wanted full evaluation of that anatomic area, which you cannot do reliably with ultrasound. It would take forever to look at every ligament and every tendon in, in the region. And before they went up to surgery, uh, they wanted an MR scan. So we found that the ultrasound just added cost and time because we always ended up with the MR scan. And uh, we didn't really have any instances where... Uh, the ultrasound picked up things that we uh, thought were surgical that uh, we couldn't evaluate on the MR examination. So it was just an added, uh, an added cost uh, in our experience. So let's talk about the spring ligament. We've talked a little bit about it up to now, but let's talk about the three components of the spring ligament. Uh, there's the superior medial, the medial plantar oblique, and the inferior plantar longitudinal. And if we kind of go to a diagram here, here's the posterior tibialis tendon, primarily attaches to the navicular, uh, but then it also attaches to the medial cuneiform and, and basically every other bone that's, that's over in this area. And that's a little, the, the other attachments are somewhat variable. The, uh, here are the three components of the spring ligament. There's the inferior plantar longitudinal, uh, that goes between the calcaneus uh, and the navicular, uh, and the oblique, which goes between the calcaneus and the tuberosity of the, the navicular. And then there's the uh, superior portion that goes deep to the posterior tibialis tendon and kind of uh, uh, then attaches to the fascia, the dorsal fascia, the extensor fascia uh, of the ankle. Uh, in the midfoot area. So here's the inter, uh, inferior plantar longitudinal, uh, the medial plantar oblique, and then the, the superior. If you look histologically, I mean, a gross specimen, here's the inferior plantar longitudinal, just above, there's a space between the two, which we can see nicely with MR. And then here we have the, the oblique and then the super, superior portion up under here, which goes under this. This is the attachment of the posterior tibialis tendon uh, in that location. And so this is called the tuberosity, and this is called the beak of the navicular bone, where these two attach. And that's a superior medial, uh, posterior bleed, uh, the, uh, and then the inferior plantar longitudinal. Yeah, meter. Okay. Now you can look at them kind of in the coronal plane, but uh, uh, I don't use this plane as my primary plane. This is the inferior plantar longitudinal. On the sagittal image, you can see it nicely going between the beak of the navicular and the calcaneus and the sagittal plane. Here's obviously sinus tarsi up here. 
Uh, here again, uh, this is uh, rather the spring ligament right here. This is the oblique component. There's the navicular. And this is the sustentaculum of the talus. And this is the oblique. Uh, now, a common way to, to look at these in the, in the axial plane, and almost all patients, if you have a normal anatomy in here, you can see the inferior plantar longitudinal are going between the beak and the calcaneus, a, a space with fluid in it here, and the medial plantar oblique uh, going uh, obliquely across here to the tuberosity of the navicular bone there. And you have this space here. It's usually a little bit triangular in shape. Uh, on the MR scan, sometimes you have to have multiple images to look at this. This is the inferior plantar longitudinal, and this is the oblique uh, component right through here, and that's that fluid-filled space in between the two of them. This is the next cut-up showing the upper part of the oblique uh, portion of the spring ligament. Uh, here's just a case of a torn uh, inferior plantar longitudinal. It's torn across here. You can see abnormal increased signal intensity uh, within it, and the oblique is intact. And here on the sagittal images, you can see a tear of that medial plantar longitudinal uh, portion of the spring ligament. When you get tears of the spring ligament, they're often associated with injuries to the sinus tarsi um, that we're going to talk about later. There are two major ligaments within the sinus tarsi and a retinaculum external to it that are important for stabilizing the subtalar joints. And sinus tarsi syndrome is often associated with, with either inflammatory disease in here, rheumatoid arthritis or infection, or tears uh, of uh, these ligaments. Typically, two of the three components are prominently seen and can be seen by MR, and one is often very atrophic. We'll talk about those in a minute. Here is that tibio uh, uh, navicular ligament coming down here. Part of it. And here we can. See. And here we can see tears. Now, when you get tears of of the uh, of these ligaments, and this is a stretched in inferior plantar longitudinal. Uh, it's typically then associated with instability of the subtalar joint. In this particular, particular case, instability between the talus and navicular, and is commonly seen with flat foot deformities. Uh, if there are uh, acquired flat foot deformities, like an adult acquired flat foot deformity, typically associated, as we'll talk about later, with posterior tibialis uh, tendinopathy, and you get increased strain on the uh, plantar longitudinal and oblique components of the spring ligament, they tend to stretch, not necessarily tear, and you can get this situation here where you see a pest planus uh, between the talus and the navicular. Okay. Let's see, who's next? I don't, I don't remember. Okay, go for it. 18-year-old uh, female, pain and swelling for six weeks after a fall. Um, so we're looking at this ligament between the calcaneus and the navicular. Looks edematous but intact. Okay. Is that the, um, the inferior plantar? Yeah, is that the uh, inferior plantar longitudinal. And it looks like we have a... Uh, trabecular injury of uh, the plantar aspect of the talus here. Uh, so this is not a rare injury. <clears throat> in this case, we also have some pest planus uh, in this location, probably due to insufficiency of the inferior plantar longitudinal. And, okay, here we have a, see it's probably partially torn. Okay. And here, if we look on the on the axial plane, we can see a tear of that inferior plantar longitudinal. It's not nice and black like it's supposed to be. And actually, the margins of the oblique are nice, not nice and sharp, which is the way they're supposed to be. So we actually have partial tears of both of these components of the spring ligament in this individual. And you can see some of the bone, trabecular bone injury that occurred uh, due to this injury. Okay. <clears throat> Then we can go to the 
Well, why don't we stop here and we'll start up with the posterior ligaments on Monday. Okay? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.